So without further ado, ado, that's later. We have Mark Denny. Have a suit. Howdy. Howdy. You guys are very strict over here. You know how it is with the time. <laughs> well, Mark. <laughs> Hi, Chico. How's are, it been? Are we late? Uh, yeah, we're a little late. You know, when you drive up from Berry County, uh, betwixt uh, Cato and uh, uh, Shell Knob down yeah. that area, uh -huh. it takes a little while. Yeah, you it know, does. Get everything going. Especially if you're, you know. And I, I would have called you, but they're trying to weed out... Uh, what you need? It's fine. It's fine. Is it hitting red? Well, that's fine. Thank you, sir. I'd like to know what the hell is going on here. Is what, you know. Well, uh, when you're a sound man and a video guy, and you're setting up chairs and tables and stuff, you know, it's it's kind of hard to do it all at the same time. <laughs> Are you the only one that runs this deal, or what? Well, What's you know, going on well, here? Well, there, there are other members. We have board members. But. I would have called you, but down in Barry County, they, they're trying to squeeze us little 4 and 3G guys out on the phone. Uh-huh. Yeah, you know, I have to climb up on the pole and stuff now. <laughs> call. I'm serious. It's getting really bad. Is Otherwise, Eddie, I'd have been in touch. Is oh, Eddie... Oh, thank you. Thirsty. You're a good you man. Thirsty, man. Thank you, Jimmy. I am Did thirsty. you run into Eddie Albert on that pole? Who? Eddie Albert. Oh, he's no longer with us. Oh, that's right. Oh, hell well, no. I thought maybe his ghost would we be We still up there. got a Mr. Haney, though, right down the road. Oh, how about <laughs> Mr. McBeebe? <laughs> Mr. McBeebe. Okay, now, you get me up here and put me on a spot. When I, f I first asked about this deal, you know, when I first, uh, before you, you called me about the Benny Mahan, I did a, the first experience I had, we did a, a roast for Benny Mahan, our dear brother, lost, lost brother, musician friend. And I thought, well, it's, it's like a posthumous deal. I thought, you know, this would be like Tom Sawyer, you know, at, at, at his own funeral wake. Yeah. You know. <laughs> and, and I thought, man, this is the last stop. This is the last stop you go, uh, apparently, in the music business around here. No, sir. Yeah. So I was having my, I was having a lot of doubts about this. Mm. That guy just stole my chair. Of course, he's not going to look at me because he really knows he did bad. Get over it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, they're, they're always stealing my thunder, DR. <laughs> well, and after that, after that deal with Benny, it was, it was really a fun deal. I really enjoyed that. But then they go, about two years during, during the COVID, they kept calling me going, Howie, we want you to do the, the, the Monday uh, monkey in the barrel or whatever, whatever uh -huh. you called it. And I thought, you know... Talking about yourself is a whole lot more nerve-wracking. Uh, I'm really good at talking about other people. Y you know what I'm saying? Oh, uh, they're, they're, around here, that's known as gossip, but it works pretty good. <laughs> so, wow, I didn't know what to expect. This is kind of like hanging out at Walmart over here. What's, you know, dip, can you dim the house lights? What the hell's going on here? Yeah, 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 yeah. My pupils are still dilating <laughs> coming in here. We're used to dark nightclubs and stuff, aren't we, Arthur? You know what I mean. You know, I don't know how to act. Well, Mark, tell us how you got started in this luxurious, greatest business in the world. I mean, we're all millionaires, and we're just making money left and right. You know, so tell us your experience. How'd you get started in this this crazy thing? Okay, I'll show you. I gotta show you. I gotta show you right here. I got them. I got them. Right here. This deal right here. Uh huh. This little deal right here, that's what, that's what started this whole ball rolling. Uh, oh, thank you. Thank you so no, much. No, no. Wrong light. No, I need these on. It's good thank to you. see you people. You can turn really, those back uh, ones off. This little deal right here uh, was, was got the ball rolling as a child, okay? Uh, and uh, that's, that's where it started. Can I touch it? You can, but it's a Martin. I don't want your greasy hands on that's it. That's a Martin. Oh. oh you hold this right here, you hold that. You're supposed to do some work. Okay. Okay, this is a 1954 Martin ukulele that my mother got in Hawaii on her Whoa. first trip over there. Yeah. And I kind of inherited it. I, yeah. Well, I stole it from her when, yeah. when she kind of had dementia there. I yeah. 
No, I, it's, no it's, been, it's been in the family and, uh, for a long time, and that's what started the whole ball rolling. So, and then I had people calling me, I want you to know, calling me the last few days going, what time you guys starting? What time's the band start? Are, are you going to have music? What's going on? And man, I didn't know what to do, so I'm trying to answer people. And I said, well, there's no music, apparently, uh, at Music Monday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but here, so I just, for everyone who thinks there's no music, we'll just, we'll just do this. Pearly shell from the ocean, shining the sun. Sure. It's like a Tiny Tim instrument. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, my, my things have descended since I first got this. Yeah. I, I was like 12. Okay. Okay. But see, it still sounds good. So anyone that's griping about no music, that's just your little deal. That's your release right there. Okay. That's it. That's it. Okay, now wait. Just to prove it, we're going we're to sing it together. Pearly shell from the ocean. Everybody. Shining in the sun. Covering the shore When I see them My heart tells me that I love More than all Little pearly shells I'm a little rusty Shells It hadn't been tuned since, you know, 1963 Whoa So, okay, yeah Well, all that's right. a Martin for you Okay, so you did hear music You heard music, right? You got music Because, man, I was panicking Everyone going, no, there's She go call and I talk to Mike Smith I go, oh, no, there, there's no music There's no music I go, oh, shit, I'm in trouble. And what brings up what I want to say a little bit is <laughs> we don't have music because we want to hear what these guys went through. We want to hear their life. They're, they're here to show you and tell you the real life deal. Oh, pretty much. Pretty I'm, much. I'm pretty glad much. to be walking upright, let alone be over here right now. You could have at least provided. Uh, excuse me. Here, uh, excuse me. Is this like a question and answer? Do you raise your hand or no? No, not yet. We'll we'll, we'll give them a chance to go after you. But right now we gotta. We want to hear from you. And well, here's all they told me. They said, if you have a little trouble, make some notes. You know. So <laughs> I I didn't know what. I'm, so I made some notes. Uh, apparently, uh, yeah. I have a little trouble with continuity and chronological order in. In the area of music, you know, <laughs> so that's where it all started. And uh, like 1964 or five, when my father was restationed in in Hawaii, he was stationed there at Hickam Field in the 50s when I was born there. Yeah, everyone made fun of me wearing Hawaiian shirts uh -huh. when we moved to the Ozarks. I said, "There's a reason for this. It's not a fashion statement. Uh, you know, we wore them to school." Yeah. You know, so it was just a natural deal. And then he got restationed again at Wheeler Field in, in the 60s. And uh, mom and dad always insisted, I think they were wise, to uh, make the kids all go to public schools. We didn't, go to, we didn't go to school on a military basis because they didn't have ukulele lessons, uh, <laughs> basically. And uh, I look back now, I go, oh, mom and dad were, were pretty smart. And, I still have a lot of lifelong friends from that era that are still, that are in the music business. Now, you mentioned to me while we were talking, you said that there's some boys over there that have listened to one of your songs, and they want to put it to Hawaiian type Yeah, song. yeah, that's, that's part of the story. I, I took notes. Oh, okay. See, see I, got, I got notes, okay? Like I said, I don't mind. Now you're going to put me on the spot like this, man. It's like some kind of, I didn't know if I was getting to some Dean Martin roast or what was going on here. We're going to get there. <laughs> okay, here we go. Well, here's what we're going to do right now. I'm going to sum this up. I've got a, I, I did a real short little sweet, uh, sort of what you call a condensed uh, version of, of this life in music. Uh, to save you a lot of work, Chico, um, I've compiled a condensed bio of my less than stellar musical story for you. Okay. So far, it's been a long, unusual trip involving luau's, church choirs, uh, prison shows, pig roasts, chicken stomps, goat roasts, swamp meets, drive-ins, battles of the band, weddings, funerals, and a bar mitzvah. Titty bars, chicken wire, road houses, biker rallies, bag twirlings, a presidential encounter, winos, celebrities, riffraff, garden parties, barn dances, swimming pool shows, river cleanups, barn dances, 
Did, did I meant I meant I meant see I double a lot of barns. We did a lot of barn dance. <laughs> Skate bag, bag tournament. Did I mention bag tour? You know, I still don't know what those are, but I've seen one, and it was scary. It was scary. Uh, let's see. Uh, ski resorts did some big concert venues and a couple coon hunts in Barry County. Oh, that'd be fun. So, well, like I tell everybody, uh, actually played uh, for a president of the United States and two winos bitch slapping each other on Commercial Street <laughs> during one of my love songs. So, I think that pretty well runs the gamut of the music industry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, you know, I'm trying to be honest because I think I don't believe in censorship, but I'm really keeping it a family show. That, that's good. Well, they're, they're, we're all family here, right, folks? Uh, so. Does that work it for you? That sums it up. Thank you. Good night. Good to see you. Did that help? Is everyone getting a focus now on where this came from? Okay. Well, I remember when the first time I met you was at that place called River Rock. Is that the name of that bar? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was co-owner of that. I was, yeah, that, yeah. And here's the thing you don't want to do. A musician should never, ever get involved in owning a nightclub. I've owned three. Have you really? Yeah. You have a lot more discipline than I do, apparently. Uh, here's what happens. Uh, you know, it's just there's too much fun, and there's just there's just too much temptation for a musician to be on that side of the stage. But at the River Rock Cafe, we did book, we had all the great bands in this area, uh, you know, around these parts, and uh, I loved every minute of it, but before you know it, you know, you got IRS people hanging out there. <laughs> DEA agents and highway patrolmen and shit. Before you know it, they're coming to your door and giving you some paperwork. Well, it's not I just did, bars that does that. <laughs> so, we lasted three years at the River Rock Cafe. It was the hottest spot in town. Yeah. And I was co-owner, boy. I was yeah. Snappy. But I, uh, I did not collect my $200, uh, you know, uh, you know, went directly to jail and didn't get, I didn't get my money. So, it's a life lesson learned. Never, musicians never join a deal like a nightclub ownership. And I know several of you that have, and I'm, I'm not pointing fingers, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's about, yeah. there you, that's about right. Yeah, you remember my partner, Tony the Toe Benedetti. Tony uh, the Toe. Boy, that's a little bit of a leery deal there, but he's a, he's, a, he's a dear good friend. I think you all, some of you know Tony. God love him. I, I like picking on people that are not here, you know. <laughs> hey, Jim, where have you been? <laughs> oh, hi. Wow, good to see you. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. I thought you moved out of town. Okay. He's living in caves now, isn't he? Who's that? Jim. Oh, Jim's everywhere. He's international. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's been one of the greatest patrons of the arts that I've ever known. So I'm here to start kissing some bottoms in this gig you here. You say he's painting the arts? Patron to the <laughs> arts. We have many of them. We got patrons. Hi, Jenny. There's my favorite patron to the arts right there. Now, you got to be careful. The camera's only looking at you. So oh, hi. <laughs> Jenny, come walk up here. That way you Cuban people walk. I, <laughs> I, I, just, I just love that. That's the only reason we've been in show business. Oh, come on up here. Oh, Jenny. Oh, my God. Oh, oh this. We don't need any stinking music. Oh, no. There's a salsa going on in her mind at all times. I, <laughs> she is my first favorite executive music producer, and Jim will do whatever he tells her. So I love that. I love it. Babaloo, Lucy, Babaloo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll get to the patrons later, but without patrons, uh, people don't realize that. You, you don't we have could records. Be rich. You don't have records. Well, pa never mind. I'm not going to go there. <laughs> Okay, I, now like I say, I made notes, and I, I did get some new cataracts put in last year, and I can really see good, but I still have trouble. You, you got know. cats in your eyes? The cataracts. Oh, cataracts. Cataract, yeah. yeah. But, but the deal is, I told them I wanted to buy a focal thing, and apparently they didn't have that technology yet. No, yeah, pretty soon they'll maybe have automatic eyes. But I can see real good well, uh, from a distance. Uh, I never realized how handsome you were. <laughs> You're a handsome man. I think that man pony thing ought to go away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you got some bad 
<laughs> mm. Mm. Cheers, as we always used to say back in the old days, with, starting out with the Flat Creek Band. Beauty is in the eyes of the beer holder, as you all know. I thought this was going to be some kind of a sit-down comedy show, so I, you know, I came unprepared. It's kind of working pretty good. <laughs> mm. So, what, uh, after you moved here from Hawaii and established yourself, uh, I got to tell you where it started right here in this little Okay, area. okay. It's on the nose. Okay, okay. Okay, in fifth grade, we, we lived in a small Hawaiian town known as Waipio Valley, uh, named after King Kamehameha, after the big Waipio Valley on the Big Island. Yeah. The big Same island. horseshoe shape. Yeah. Our little school, a yeah. little rural school uh, through sixth grade, was right on the edge of a big thousand-acre pineapple field. So, and it was, yeah, it was fabulous, you know. And uh, we had little pineapple sales going on on the side. Yeah, it was like California. I was there when they had <laughs> oranges on trees. You could pick them and eat them. Exactly. Yeah. And well, we weren't supposed to be picking them, but I was a paper boy, and that paper bag held a lot of pineapples because <laughs> whenever they came ripe, you could just smell the pineapples wafting through this clear to Wahiwa, almost to the North Shore. And, and all of the industrious little fellers we went to school, we were, we were all paper boys. We had, yes. we had big paper sack that we carried newspapers in. And, okay, and uh, they had these water towers, you know, the, the open water. We swam in and irrigation ditches with that cool. Oh, so like it was Petticoat a, Junction? Sort of like that. But were, were there girls in there? But no. No, no, they, they were scared. We were guys okay. carrying ukuleles, man. Oh, okay. You know, guys carrying ukuleles, here's one good thing about a ukulele. You never see gangs of people in Hawaiian shirts carrying ukuleles around. You know, they're not going to steal your car. They're not going to rob you. There's no crime waves in Hawaii. It's just a wonderful place to be, you know. So, don't get me sidetracked. <laughs> okay. Now, here in Waipil Valley, the, the music, I'm talking about, the, the reason I'm talking about this, we had music teachers we had traveling a music teacher, a beautiful Hawaiian lady that came when we were in fifth grade, and they brought all these little cool instruments. And you could bring, if you had a ukulele or an instrument, bring it to school. It was, it was a class that, that they, they had music with a traveling music teacher. I've got a book this thick of Hawaiian songs, ukulele Do Hawaiian you? songs, that my mom gave me. Really? Yeah. Uh, it's huge. You might be one of the brothers. She came like every other week. It was like You're a, a finally figuring that out? No, I, I knew you were, you were gifted, but I didn't know you knew any Hawaiian stuff. Yeah. I might need you on this new record here. You better start being nicer to me. <laughs> okay. You came on a record, but calling me up going, there's no music at Music Monday. <laughs> you, know, you know, and people, you know, what are you going to tell people? No, it's, it's not about music. And this is a tough gig for me. Okay. Okay, and they came to teach, like, it was a music appreciation. And what a concept, because I don't know too many schools in America, this was in the 60s, where, where they had traveling teachers that brought all their toys and played the piano, and you broke out your ukuleles. And yeah, yeah. It was a fun deal, and that, that really impacted me, because I, you know, I had a little trouble with math, you know, but I was real good at reading. And, uh, but ukulele day, everybody showed up to school wow. on ukulele day, and they, and they taught lessons. And uh, it was fantastic. We were rebels without a cause, you know. <laughs> ukulele. Cause. Well, yeah, there weren't no electric guitars at the time till later. Um, well, there were steel guitars. Yes, that came later. That was a kitschy sort of a Hawaiian form. As you know, the slack key was the, yeah. the true Hawaiian yeah. form. Oh, that, yeah. yeah. They got from the Panelo yeah. Paniolos uh, yeah. from Spain that came over to work the cattle. That's a whole other story. Yeah. Um, uh, and I'm really tickled uh, that the... Uh, you know that this that this took place because they didn't have those kind of classes at the, at some of the strict stricter schools. Um, you know, on the military bases. You know, I th I think you know, and we did. They they taught you you know the national anthem and proper saluting and stuff like that. At school? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we did. We we said the pledge of allegiance, and then you know we sang stuff oh, on yeah. the ladies. Yeah, yeah. It was a different culture, and in the '60s. It opened my eyes up to how cool stuff could really be, you know? So that's why now I'm explained, you know, the Hawaiian shirts. I earned this right to wear these. So, okay, let me check my notes. Okay, so we're playing this band. I'm the only white kid in school, 
I was, I was like white until it turned brown. I had a shock of hair when I had hair. It was white. And they, they adopted me. I was the token white kid at school. <laughs> so I said, hey, let's get together. We're, we're going to put a band together. And, and I got to join the band. There's some pictures of it there when we were 12. I stuck out like a, like a sore thumb in that deal. But I was excited because they said, you make a good bass player. So the first bass in town, it wasn't really a bass. The guy, it was a big old fat hollow body guitar. I forgot what it was. So the leader of the band, Charlie Ricardo, put four strings on the top of it. He goes, oh, this is a bass guitar. I'm going to teach you to play the bass guitar. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you had to share the same amplifier with three or four people. And you sang out of that same thing. Well, well Stu Sutcliffe, <laughs> yeah, he had a six string. He turned that into a bass. <laughs> <laughs> so we couldn't work under these conditions at the age of 12. You know? Oh, yeah. No, I'm kidding. I'm being facetious. Okay, try not to look so serious, Chico. Good <laughs> okay, so it was, had four strings, and I thought they were just humoring me because you know, they didn't want me to be confused, you know. Uh, and later, we had uh, our principal son, uh, Roy Takimoto, showed up with the very first Fender bass guitar. Thank God <laughs> this bass playing deal was done. I wanted to move up front with maracas and a tambourine. And let me sing some stuff. So, and I, I had to move around. This guitar was big as I was. There wasn't no strutting around with that. Oh yeah. You know how cool that is. Oh yeah. It's very important. Yeah. You know, originally people go, "Why did you get into music business?" I said, "It's to sleep late, get out of work, and meet girls." And, yeah. Uh, I've been chastised a lot for that by a lot of. It's a joke. It was a joke. <laughs> I think we could take a vote right now and probably. Okay, so in, in Hawaii, in the 60s, they had a big thing. Uh, there were drive-ins in every little town. This was on Oahu before it got real crowded. So you had these drive-ins. Every Sunday, they had swap meets, you know, like a big flea market deal. And the bands would play, and they had these battle of the bands. So we did that whole deal for a couple of years. So we won this battle of the bands deal, and uh, it, was, it was a mystery to us. We won it. And we got this whole deal. And then we got a letter from Don Ho. Don Ho asked us to play. He had a nightclub in Waikiki. Yeah. So he asked the Night Riders. This was the name of our band. We had little three-cornered hats and stuff. And we, we rode the bus. The first band we ever saw was Paul Revere and the Raiders at the Honolulu Civic Auditorium. For, for a quarter, you could ride everywhere on the island all day long for a quarter a day. So... Yes, everybody rode the bus. It was called the bus. So we go, Paul Revere and the Raiders. It was the first rock concert I'd ever been to. So we went there and we're going, we got to get some of these hats, man. Yeah. <laughs> so we got these three corner hats and we, we had these black double neck sweaters and we were cool. But true story, I still got that letter somewhere. I was trying to find it. I had to dig all this stuff out of trailer and stuff. And a, a letter from Don Ho to, to appear on his show. When his people found out we were only 12 years old, they put the, they put the kibosh on that. We couldn't know it was a nightclub. We, we couldn't even go in uh, with our parents, you know, because it was, it was really? as liberal as Hawaii is, it was pretty strict about that. And we, were, we were heartbroken about the whole deal. But later, just due to the uh, swap meet exposure, we were the hit of the luau circuit. <laughs> Got, oh, no, hell no, no, no. You look back there, you'll see it. I'm the guy sticks out in the middle, the white guy and stuff. But anyhow, at the Luau's, we got invited to Luau's, and we were all of a sudden professional musicians. Yeah. We were, you know, we were getting like well over 4 or $5 a piece for a show. And, hey, in 1965, 4 or 5, that was a lot of money because you, you got to eat all the good food. Those people knew how to eat over there. So, well, Willie used to say, if you could put food on the table, you were a success playing music. Wow. You know, we did borrow a lot of food when we left those luau's. I yeah. did. Oh, yeah. I, I brought stuff home. I filled my pockets full all the time. <laughs> but, you know, that's when he became, all of a sudden, you're a professional musician yeah. at the age of 12. And yep. we, we worked that whole deal because in Hawaii, a tradition among Hawaiian people is to... Uh, their children, their first birthday, they throw a big party. It's, the first birthday's bigger than your 16th birthday, like you'd have at a bar mitzvah or whatever. They throw a party. 
and it 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 was just awesome. So we were working all those. We were we were the Luau circuit kid. Wow, it was awesome. So anyhow, and here's another odd deal. I told you this was a long unusual story. We got invited. We we got invited to play on a local TV show called the Filipino Fiesta. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm not kidding you. Uh, a lot of a lot of Filipinos, the Asian, the Pacific Rim. There were people from everywhere. So so we got to go. Well, we're gonna be on TV now, and everyone spoke Tagalo, and you know, uh, of course, me and the Van Gods, we all spoke good English. But you ain't gonna believe this. We we were introduced on the Sunday TV show by Ferdinand and Mel DeMarcos. It's, oh. it's in a book. He was the, he was the MC of this deal, and they got a. He go, it's the Night Rider Orchestra, Maestro. He knew a little a little nothing, but you remember that whole you know Melda, the one with three thousand pairs of shoes. We didn't know that then. We were kids. Okay. Later we found out that we prop we propped him up during. Uh -huh. In the war, uh, you know. Uh -huh. uh, oh yeah, yeah. And, and then we gave them amnesty, and they, they they were on Oahu. They moved over there, and I think they may have bilge pumped quite a bit of uh, gold out of that place. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm sure she had all them shoes. Then we just didn't know it. Yeah. And uh, wow. And not till later did we pull this book out. My mom found this book and had everything in it, and had had us there with the first man in the mouth. <laughs> I go. So we went from the Luau uh, circuit to being introduced by corrupt world leaders. <laughs> <laughs> and it gets stranger. It gets stranger. I ain't making this shit up. I want to tell you that right now. You all that know me, uh, I don't believe in censorship much. I, I try to keep it nice for a family show. You all are family. Right? I don't see any kids. <laughs> I don't see any kids. <laughs> I'm glad you came for immoral support, DR. Thank you. <laughs> mm. Okay. Now for the next phase, right here, after that, see that was just a big highlight. We worked that work worked that deal till Dad got restationed again in Florida at uh, Air Force Base in Florida. My dad was a missile man. He was in silos and and worked on rockets and stuff. We never knew where Dad was. Dad was gone all the time and. We didn't ask no questions, you know, because you weren't allowed to. It was all class. Was it? It was you and your brother and my br three brothers and a sister and mom. And yeah. Dad goes. He had to go away and do so. We understood. Yeah. It was all good. So he gets stationed in Florida. So we get down there. They busted up my seventh grade. I had to go away and I was crying. I was crying. My Hawaiian friends showed up at the airport at like four in the morning to give us lays and tell us goodbye, and it was, it, it broke my heart. I go, Mom, Dad, I'm, I'm staying, I want to stay, I'm staying here, you know, you're 15 years old, or whatever, you know, so I had to load up with them, because it's a shame that your parents have to be in charge of you till you're 15, yeah. like yeah. that. Even yeah. in a liberal state like Hawaii, I was, we were upset about it. So we get to Florida, and there was a whole lot of stuff going on, uh, the civil rights thing was going on. There was all kinds of trouble, and they were busting people, and it was it was bad. And my dad, uh, my dad, one of the most wonderful, smart guys in the world, said, "I'm going to send you back to Missouri to live with your grandparents." And that that's what you did with juvenile delinquents. Uh, you know that are 15, 16 years old. You go to Missouri and live with your grandparents. They'll straighten your ass out. You know and. I go, I like Florida, Dad. It's kind of like Hawaii, only flatter, you know. <laughs> so I ended up, when they shipped me and my older brother back, he went, he went to Crane, and I went to a little rural school called Jenkins, Jenkins School down on Flat Creek, and I showed up. Y'all familiar with that? Wow, we got, some, we got some people from, they live over near Cato, don't you? You ever by Cato? <laughs> So I showed up down there at the end of my seventh grade. I showed up in Hawaiian shirts and short pants and my little Pacific Rim shoes. It was, hey, it was hot. And in my class, when I showed up, there were five guys in my class. And they go, all right, here's the new kid in town. Let's beat him up, you know? And we think he might be gay or something. What's he wearing? He's wearing Hawaiian. They'd never seen a Hawaiian shirt in 1967. 
So, you know, bravely, I, you know, and they're the best friends in the world of mine now, but I said, let's get it over with. I've been to, I've been to nine schools before eighth grade, moving around in the military. I said, you go ahead and beat me up. Let's get this shit over with, okay? I'm tired of this. So I made it through the end of that seventh grade, and then the eighth grade, there was sixth, seventh, and eighth grade in the same room. And by eighth grade, you got to sit by the window over there so you could look out on the pasture out there. And uh, I go, I have arrived right now. <laughs> well, there was like six of us, so we went to Cassville, and they give you a diploma. I got a diploma in eighth grade, and I come home and told my grandparents, I, you know, call mom and dad, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Oh, my dad about popped the vessel. You're going to go to high school, and if you got any sense, you're going to try to pay yourself into college. You know, so, I mean, but, but in the rural schools of, of these areas, that's as far as they went because they worked on the farm, you know, and, and they had things to do. During deer season, no one showed up for school for two weeks. I go, what the hell am I doing here? I, I didn't have a gun, you know. Uh, you know, so these are, these are true stories. And some of the best memories of my life, um, when I graduated and got my diploma, uh, Mr. Gottney at Jenkins that drove the little short bus, I rode a short bus, I want you to know. <laughs> that don't surprise a lot of you. Sis Ann, you should have, the guys from Jenkins showed up in that short bus. We had that teacher named Ed, he was special. We called him Special Ed, you remember? No, that, that's not the case at all. A lot of us were pretty intelligent. You know, so we rode a short bus. Here I go again. I'm going to get my ass beat again. And so then I'm in Aurora. I'm in Aurora High School. My dear friend, Sis Ann's dad was the principal after. That's why I really hung on you a lot, Sis. <laughs> Didn't buy me no favors, did it? No. Was so, she your teacher or something? No, but she was in the system for many years. She was the principal's daughter, man. Oh. Oh. You, yep, man. I he, just saw her nodding. I just didn't know, you know, he's he, being nice. You just never know. She, she's, and we've been friends ever since, regardless of all the things that, that, that happened. Well, so I, went to, I know what you went through. I moved from California to Ozark. Okay, okay. <sighs> well, that's a similar deal. Oh, it's similar, that's boy, for sure. Boy, I bet you stuck out mad, boy. Oh, yeah, I, had man striped, bun, didn't I had you? striped bell-bottom pants, and, <laughs> and I was barefooted, and I thought, well, if it's barefooted, I thought, and then I realized there's rocks every... <laughs> Every foot, I went, well, that's the end of that. Wow, I feel a lot better about you now. <laughs> you know, I really do. I, and that was my senior year. I left, <laughs> I left California my senior year. I to thought Ozark. you grew up a special privileged guy. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. Good. I have a lot more respect for you now. Okay, uh, you want to play music again? Oh, Last yeah. time you walked but out, I, I had you to walked get, out on me, man, with a right? bad attitude. I had, to, I had to go up against Buff. <laughs> I didn't have six-year-olds or anything. It was Buff <laughs> Lamb I had to deal with. We've made a lot of progress here this evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, there will be billable hours for you, yeah. Chris. Okay. All right. Meeting second time next Monday, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> ah, right, all right. Anyhow, and sis, and I became a member of the Aurora Hound Dog Marching Band. This is the next music movement. I finally got that trumpet I always wanted. I got a trumpet. My dad listened to uh, Doc Severson, a Satchmo. Uh, the big band stuff, a jazz. My dad yeah. was a jazz guy, and my mom cried and ironed listening to Hank Williams and Marty Robbins, and I, it was a very eclectic family. I didn't know whether to cry or get up and dance you know, <laughs> half the damn time. So these are your parents. This true story. So to kind of impress dad, I I did want to be a horn player, and when in Hawaii, you're horny? when I went to Wahiwa, they give me, I wanted to be a trumpet player. Oh, we got a trumpet for you. Yeah, you yeah, new kid. They give me a big old baritone horn. Said, oh, it's the same thing, kind of only deeper. And uh, so you carried this big baritone horn around, and I thought, man, this ain't cool. I had a big old ringworm thing on my mouth <laughs> up, up here. I go, I ain't going to meet none of these pretty Hawaiian girls. And you know, I got that big lip thing. It's boom, 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 boom. It was just shy of a tuba player, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. So I got to Aurora, and you know, with their big giant budget, sis, and uh, Gene Kirkham gave me my first trumpet to, to practice on until I could afford one. I was happy, happy, happy. We marched, Roar Hound Dog Marching Band was, we got very well known, we marched everywhere we went. March, march, march. 
And we went to the, uh, we marched around the track at the Indianapolis 500, down the brick road, clear around that track. You had to walk sideways on the, down on the corner. <laughs> And seriously, we, we burned the soles off of our shoes. I go, if you can, if you can play in Indianapolis, you can play anywhere. <laughs> and we had these red wool suits on with them big ass hats. Did you have the big white hat? The big... Yeah, red and white. But yeah, these were wool. This is before oh, they went I, to cotton. I was an Ozark band. I know you that. know the wool oh. suit deal. I was a drummer. Carry that thing around with you all the time. Oh, okay. You guys were cool. You didn't have to carry much. Yeah. You know. Oh yeah. <laughs> But since then, and we, we played at the Cotton Bowl. We marched at the halftime at, at, at the Cotton Bowl in Memphis. Wow, and Aurora Band was really good, weren't yeah, it? Yeah, I loved playing, and, and I actually learned some music theory of playing music, playing the trumpet. You know, uh, music theory to me at the time was don't touch a bass player, he's irritable. What year you was know? that? That was, that's all I knew. It's all I knew because, you know, three chords and a, and a story is. Country what year music, was that? Baby. What huh? year was that? In uh, 1968, 69, our freshman year. So I worked my way up before I got out of high school. I got right up next to uh, Pete Summers back there. He was first trumpet player, and I go, I'm never going to get to be first trumpet till he gets out of here. <laughs> he finally graduated, and then they moved me up, and I got to raise the flag in the morning out in front of the school. There you go. Yeah, hey, we were pretty cool. I was double tonguing before I got out of there. Pete, well, that's a, that's a trumpet term, okay. Triple tonguing didn't happen. Only Doc Severinsen and those guys uh, could triple tongue. I never reached that song. I figured I'm going to have to switch instruments here for a while. Well, the, the ringworm thing was just smaller after that, you know, with the trumpet. And at the time, I don't think chicks dug guys with the ringworm on their lip. So... <laughs> I go, man, I'm going to have to get a guitar soon, you know, because that's where it's at. <laughs> you know, and I'd always dabbled in the guitar. Yeah. This, this is a true story. So what happened after the day I graduated from high school, I loaded up in my 63 Volkswagen and moved down to Branson. I had a job at Silver Dollar City as a cave guide, okay? Yeah. I was a cave guide. Hey, I was good. I was like cave guide of the year for a couple of years till I turned bad and... They gave me a job. Anyhow, we stayed in this little cabin over near Mutton Hollow over there, and that's where the Flat Creek Band was first formed. Some of my other cave guide buddies, Bobby Watkins, come down there. Uh, let's see, Charlie Ray. Let me list off some of these guys, because I want you to come up here. Okay? Let's see here. Where is that? Okay, I got notes. Okay. <laughs> We all okay. need notes these days. We were a bluegrass band. I was a picture over there of the deal. Uh, formed a cabin down in Mutton Hollow. Uh, Jim's mom is, and her and her lovely uh, demeanor gave us a cabin to live in that summer. So we called all our buddies in uh, that worked at SDC, most of them, and we formed this little band. Uh, let's see who all was in that. You guys know who you are, okay? And it's a collective deal because. Most bands that I work with, we, ha we have a long history of, of collaboration. And people go, Howie, how did you hang together all these years with some of your bands? We were friends to start with. Yeah. Musicians were friends, okay? And people came and they went with, with no ill feelings. So our Flat Creek Bluegrass Band started with me, Bob Watkins, Charlie Ray, Mike Weldy, Rita Herbert, Craig Richardson, Greg Payton, James Engel, Billy Poole, Bud Johnson, Danny Boyce, and Richard Bruton took out and toured some ski resorts and stuff. So we actually, we, we kind of, you guys know some, some of these people. So then things kind of lit up, you know, from a traditional bluegrass, we, we cut our eye teeth on them. Richard played. Richard traveled played to Colorado with, with us. bluegrass? He, he really did, and he was good. He was good. What did he play? He was not. He was not so bossy back then. <laughs> I love Richard. I invited him. Oh, he was. He set the thing on fire, and then adding. He played bluegrass with saxophone. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, oh, I would love to you know, have seen that. He was better on the ballads. True story. We get to this. We did the grand opening for Beaver Creek, Colorado, out there. Uh, an agent here in Springfield. So we all drove this big van. We had a dynamite sound truck with the bunks in it. We got from yeah. Johnny Gott. Yeah. 
So we get out there. You got to acclimate. Here's the deal. You got to acclimate when you go. So Richard goes, I got a gig over here in Colorado or somewhere down to deal with. I'll be flying in. Pick me up at the airport. So, we're, you know, we're all nervous. You know? So we went to get him at the airport. He's got his floor shine shoes on, a, a thin black leather jacket. And it's like, you know, 10 below zero. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's wintertime up there. Going, Richard, Richard, Richard. We're giving him long underwear. He didn't have much common sense about the weather. Well, that, yeah. nothing's changed. He showed up <laughs> an hour. We played for a couple weeks from four to seven for the grand opening for this big, big new ski lodge, you know, where all the hoity toities live uh -huh. and all that. And uh, he showed up an hour before the deal. And he goes, I'm ready, I'm ready. He goes, God, it's cold out here. I'm freezing my hands on. So we started in. He started blowing that saxophone. Bobby Watkins will tell you, he turned all gray and started bobbing around. He fell off stage left into a pile of, <laughs> into guitar cases and, and, and a coach and stuff. I shit you not, this is true, he, he fainted. Well, the altitude. You, you know the altitude in my mind, the oxygen stand, he fell over. We had to stop the show and they, you know, and they brought the, the health person from this, this big giant resort and they gave him, he was on, he gave him oxygen and Richard's going, cognac, cognac, cognac. <laughs> <laughs> they, they give Richard some oxygen, true story, cognac and oxygen. He was revived. He jumped back up on stage and, <laughs> and, and actually finished the show out. And he was all apologetic because he, he didn't know. No common sense. Arthur, you guys all know Richard. We all know and love Richard. I'm only making fun of him because he's not here. Like yeah. I told you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I invited him. Richard, you're not here, are you? All right. Okay. Yes. At Beaver Creek, Bill, you're kidding me. Did you know a story about the president showing up? Okay, they, they had this guy. We played from 4, 4, 3, 7, 30 at the end of the ski day when they come off the lifts. We kept looking up on the slopes. They got these binoculars. There's this guy with two people in front of him and two people behind him. He, he got to ride up in a snow cat. And, you know, we had free lift tickets, so we got to ski every day. We were young. We skied, played oh, music. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Anyhow, they go... I go, how come we don't get to ride up in that thing? Because I fall off that lift all the time. They go, because he's the president of the United States. And Who is that, Nixon? Gerald Ford. Oh. Well, as true story, I wish it could have been someone like Richard Nixon or someone. It would have been a better story. But <laughs> Gerald, I, I'm not politically inclined. Good fella. But he kept falling down, falling down. <laughs> I was waiting for that. <laughs> Anyhow, this is where this whole deal started. These Secret Service guys, we, once we found out, you never go, uh-oh, boys. That first day, they said, the guys come over and lumpy. They're wearing lumpy jackets and shit. And they come over, and they want, they're looking through all our stuff. Look, I go, who are you guys? He goes, we're here with the President of the United States. He's going to be here for 445. And we never really dealt with uh, this sort of thing before because we didn't like people digging around in our stuff like that. You know, <laughs> and... and and so uh, where this tradition started, one of the band guys, I forget who it was, James Engel or Bud or somebody, they go, you ain't got any dogs, have you? <laughs> These guys flashed their guns and go, we know who every one of you little hippie sons of bitches are, and we want to know about that truck that says dynamite on it out there <laughs> parked in it. I'm serious. It was a sound, remember, dynamite sound coming? They were serious. And then we're going, oh, God almighty. And they said, we're here. We don't care what you hippie sons of bitches do out in that van. We know you're smoking pot, doing all kinds. Of... It wasn't real popular to smoke pot back in the, in the 70s, like that, late 70s. Well, it, it was for some of us. Well, it but... was. But, but they read us the riot act, and uh, it, all, it all turned out, turned out good. But kind of scared us. They, they knew everything we knew. But how smart could these guys be worried about a truck? You're not going to put dynamite on the side of a truck. Carrying dynamite, <laughs> you, you know. So we caught him. We busted him with that deal. That's a true story. It slept four, and there were two drivers, and hopefully one was awake while the other. You took the whole band, all your gear. You remember those trucks, Arthur? You remember dynamite, Johnny? That's that's another little true story. That got to be a running joke. Every time we we had government people, we played for a couple of governors. You they come they over truck. to look, and they got them little machine deals. Yeah, like, yeah. You ain't got any dogs. Last one did it was Benny Mayhem. He goes, you ain't got any dogs, have you? Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, you remember? Oh, that was at Tom Stewart's Bar in Aurora when the governor and the wife came down. So we've had a lot of familiarity, like I say, dealing all the way from riffraff and fans to presidents of the United States. And I prefer, I prefer the winos on Commercial Street, basically, because those gigs were a lot looser. This was very, kind of very structured. It, they just stare at you the whole gig, give you the stink eye, you know. I'm, God, I'm nervous as a, a wreck. You can't perform when you're nervous like that. You've seen how these guys turned out. Okay, where was I? Okay. We're in Colorado. Oh, okay. So right now, this is, was, a, was a highlight for about a 10-year period. Where's, where's Weldy? Mike Weldy up here. Uh, Bob Watkins over here. Where's the Flat Creek boys? The Flat well, there's Creek one boys, right there. they're there's always in the bathroom. Oh, you weren't Flat I know, Creek? but you play, we used to play with you guys a lot at home, growing over Dora Fish Fry. Bobby, Bobby, where are you, Bobby? And uh, Mike, Mike Weldy, uh, I know Rick Baker ain't here, and there's I know some there. of them are no longer with us. Charlie Ray's not here. Bobby Weldy, Richard's not here. Danny Boyce is here. Danny, come up here. Danny was a Flat Creek guy. We picked him up on the corner of... Heart attack and vine up here in Springfield. I'm so proud of you. Here, here's some music theory. Uh, you got jury graduates, studied musicians, and I'm going, we'll never be able to afford him. And uh, he goes, no, I just want to play. This is some fun music. Because we went from bluegrass, we evolved into more of a, a country rock thing, and we were, we were producing our own songs and made a record album. And I think Danny was just in it for the girls, weren't you? No, he, he played bass with us and uh, for several years. Um, and I'm going to let you tell a little story until Bobby gets up here. Tell, tell us a highlight about your Flat Creek short-lived career. Well, first of all, I didn't start out as the bass player. Bobby Watkins was a bass player, and he was doing just fine without me. They, they got me in because I was a little small, skinny kid, and I could sing high harmonies. And uh, so uh, me and Rita and who else was singing at that time? There was like three or four of them. Craig Ritson. Craig Well, we had a bunch of doo-wop girls and me oh, yeah, and, and we were singing yeah, harmonizing. And, I, and I just, they decided that I looked naked up there without anything. So they stuck a guitar in my hand and they put a little Diodario pickup on my acoustic guitar. And I said, okay, here you go. And I said, but I don't know the chords. He said, that's okay. We're just going to turn it down anyhow. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, so it was a ruse. I, I wanted you for your high harmony singing. <laughs> that's because I thought we were like Poco. <laughs> well, and we were. I mean, the harmonies were great. I wanted to be like Poco, and uh, Danny, I didn't mean to trick you like that, but he's a bass player, so we well. we gave him an acoustic guitar and told the sound man just keep that thing turned down. He gonna sing. He gonna he gonna. <laughs> Later, he was a little miffed about it. He got a little puffy over it, and uh, but he hung in there. Well, eventually, I learned a couple of chords. So, I mean, we didn't have a lot to learn because there's only three chords. It takes three chords and a good story. And a good is story. A, that's all you need for a country song. But in the Flat Creek, the fifth bar, you were up there. You hired people to go past the fifth fret. That's right. Those are called hired guns, Danny. There's no money past the fifth fret. I told you that. That's, Wayne that's, Carson taught me that. That's, that's what I've always been told. Dan, you know classical music, still three chords is just a whole bunch of notes. I know. That's right. <laughs> That's right. But Danny Boyce here, uh, Craig Richardson, and uh, Richard Bruton, and some of them fellows were some of the first music theory uh, people that, that we had in, in a hillbilly band that started out playing bluegrass. And I thought, man, we got we got to expand our horizons. Now I got like, I got some minor chords I can play <laughs> now. We did. So it was all good. Uh, uh, John so, Wilkes back there was our sound man. You remember Skinny? Come here, Skinny. You remember so, John Wilkes? There was John Wilkes... Uh, Dago Dell Daytoni. Did Dago Dell make it? Y'all know Dago Dell. He, he did a lot of uh, photo work for us on all them goofy record covers and stuff like that. You remember Dago Dell? Skinny, come up here. Skinny was our babysitter and the man that had to go in and write. Bob's he had to go too. write to places a check to pay for our bar bill after a gig. Oh, he's going to take his. Danny, I'll stay. Put him in the chair. I'll stay. The chair. Sit down here. Sit down here. He'd yeah. be in hot seat. I'll, uh, I'll fill a couple of bars here for Howie. Um, <laughs> the 
some of the uh, first road trips of the band uh, with Big Band Dan here. Uh, we, Big Band Dan, I forgot that. We, I always called him Rooster Boy because he had an attitude, brother. <laughs> We had, we yeah, had, he'd get all bulled up. His feathers would get bulled up. He goes, I'm quitting. Well, and then he, well, he I go, well, go ahead. He was back the next gig. He showed up. He goes, can I play again? <laughs> <laughs> Boy, we, had a, we had a little problem with the, uh, with the vocals. Uh, if you've ever done a show and you, you, know, you do a four-hour show and yeah, you have breaks, but you do four sets. And uh, I've worked with Mr. Andy Williams for 17 years and he found out that Noah, you can't do two shows a day. You know what I mean? And Howie, <laughs> Howie was singing and carrying the load of nearly all the vocals. And it was killing. And we'd book some gigs every now and then where we'd do Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And there's nobody to relieve him. And the only way he got relief is if we played an instrumental. And we didn't know many instrumentals, so. <laughs> Kenny, I was young. We needed the money. I took up so, the harmonica, remember? So Big Band Dan was the first chance we had to bring in somebody that could sing, and we could take some of the pain off of Howie, and I guess the, the doo-wop girls, did, they, they helped, you know, they helped bring things along, because uh, it was, when did we get somebody else to actually sing with you? Well, since I wrote the songs, there weren't too many takers on the deal, because no one could sing that low, gutterable horrible uh, deal that I was doing. Uh, it was, you know, skinny. It was a well, tough gig. I, I will share this one story and I'll get out of here because there's too many stories. You ain't going anywhere. You share a good story. I, <laughs> Don't fool around I, with it. You, you, we, you we, turn we, the knobs on One of it. the first shows that we did in Branson was at an Elks Club. <laughs> oh my. Okay. And this it was, was an Elks Club. This was a long time ago. And we didn't know anything about the Elks. I, we just thought they were kind of like Shriners. But different. Without you know. the funny hats. <laughs> yeah. And we weren't told a lot about the rules. And it was right downtown Branson, as I recall, real close to the train tracks down there. And toward the end of the show, we were informed that all the beer we drank was not free. This is like the, <laughs> like the Blues Brothers. And it, and it wasn't discounted. And... <laughs> Cut, carry the one, come over four to five, and you owe us 89 bucks. Yeah, I said, all oh, your wait friends, minute, wait you and your friends. I, I'm here to get the band's money for the night. I, I've got eight people here, six on stage and two running the show, and we need to get paid. They and use they, the word entourage. You yeah, and your entourage uh, yeah. drank more liquor than yeah. you made in money and wanted us to write them a check. Well, I, I had to inform the band of that, and... <laughs> It didn't sit real well with our lead guitar player. We called him Big C for a reason. He he was a big boy. Craig Richardson. Yes, yeah, Craig Richardson. And I do remember it was around Christmas because Big C grabbed a Christmas tree and waltzed it out and danced with it in the floor and walked on all the bulbs and broke the bulbs and finally pulled the tree out of the wall so there were no lights on it. How we got out of there that night without them killing us, I have no idea. But I don't think we got paid. I don't think there was. I joined the Moose Club right after that. Skinny yeah. up. Yeah. Them, those Elks were very strict. I love the Elks. Uh, this is a great venue. I remember playing here all the time. We had no problem here in Springfield. It was that Kimberling City outfit down. Kimberling City. That was it. And uh, they, during, you know, and I'm all for those quiet, sacred moments, and they bang a gong and stuff. and Someone was distracted in the back, back there. And I, you know, just stuff happens. It was meaningless. And uh, we were ostracized from Kimberling City till the bearded clam opened, of course. Uh, yeah, we, uh, we did get back in there for a couple of gigs. I kind of left the band after a certain point, and the story continued. Uh, but when we were traveling with the large show, <laughs> before we had all the instrumentation that they have today, it took us a long time to travel and to set up and tear down, and it was a major event. And it wasn't, it wasn't no place for babies, I'll tell you. How come you gotta tell the bad story, Skinny? The highlight was when you got us that gig for Andy Williams' Christmas party. You remember that one? Yeah. He, well, uh, we were, do you remember that one? We, uh, uh, we met Bob Goulet and all these Hollywood people coming up there. And Debbie Boone. Debbie Boone. Debbie Boone out 
doing the crab dance. Yeah, we played. I gave her my heart, and she gave me the crabs. And Debbie song. Boone was out doing the uh, crab dance. Yeah, Andy had a stunt double. He had a brother that was a stunt double. And they all loved it now, got up, and they started doing this line dance, doing some crab dance. I go, Debbie Boone, I thought she was real conservative. And uh, it was a Christmas party in Branson. I I'd never seen nothing like that in Branson. Well, Rob, Bob Goulet was there, and I thought his mustache was painted on. <laughs> and I, I met him at the bar, and I swear to God, it wasn't real. But I've never seen him without it, you know. He passed away a few years later during surgery. But, I like Bob. But they, he had everybody out here dancing. And then Benny and them stopped, and they had to do their version of Moon River for Andy Williams. Oh, my and God. This, this is like singing I Left My Heart in San Francisco for Tony Bennett. Yeah, okay? This was cringeworthy. You, you don't do that. You only Andy Williams could sing Moon River. That That's was, right. Oh, my God. And, well, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Benny, Benny, Benny did, did it with job. respect, and he did it slow, and and did it through, and then halfway through it, it was like bam, 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 and they kicked it into bluegrass double time. Oh, and Andy's up, and right. Andy's grinning like a possum. They uh, loved it. You know, we always said that town needed an enema, and uh, well. We, well, we got fired. We got fired down there three we times. We got fifteen hundred dollars for. Uh, they got fifteen hundred dollars for doing the show that night. So it was a nice, <laughs> nice piece of work. And <laughs> Andy gave us the nod, though. And, and ben, Bob Goulet is up. We're over smooth. Betty's over. Going, hey, Bob, how are things out in Hollywood? <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm going. Oh my God, they finally like us here in Branson now. You know? That's that's a true story. So once again, the bottom of the rung to hanging out. And, and playing some good gigs with some fun we, we traveled, people down there. Um, we did two trips to Nashville, and Allie and I, we were hired as part of the crew and the entertainment, I think, as, as the thing. But we were working for the people that were doing the 25th anniversary of the Ryman Auditorium. Grand and Ola. there were no lights and there was no sound in the Ryman. It had been shut down and the new Opryland had opened, and that's where the stage was. So they opened it back up. They brought in a Sony semi from New York to mix the sound. They had to lay all their wires. Howie and I showed up the first morning, and we had to lay all the cables and stuff for the video. We were the video crew. I was just a grip, and, and then they said, I'm a, you're a camera guy now. And about an hour later, they go, you're the man with the mic. And yeah. I go, I'm going to need a little pay raise for this deal. So he, he was a guy with the monkey cam. These new digital booms and things was coming out in uh, KC Post, Kansas City, high tech stuff. And they go, we need a man with a mic. So Skinny went around with his camera and we were kicking in doors trying to get an interview from Porter Wagner and little Jimmy Dickens and, and all these people. Most of them were very, very friendly to us uh, they were. to come in. They were. And uh, a few of them slammed the door on your foot, remember? Yes, I, I got the door slammed. It's not always pretty. I, I also got to uh, Waylon Jennings and my camera was capable of shooting uh, you sitting on the couch with your mom and dad without any additional light. This was the first digital camera. So you could walk in a room with a small camera and shoot big time quality. We call it the scary cam because everybody just thought it was some stupid home camera. It cost almost $6,000. And the, the picture and the sound you got was you could sit over in the corner and be a little fly on the wall. And Waylon Jennings was sitting there on the couch, and his buddy started asking him about missing the flight that his seat buddy Holly took. And we know how that ended. Told that story. And that, that, was, that story. That and was touching. Waylon that. said he hadn't thought about it much of his life, but he was starting to think about it more every day. Yeah. And, when and that then, was the last show that, that Waylon did at the, at the He Rhino. did. And yeah. then we went back the second time for another thing. And once people found out in there that we were with the Grand Ole Opry people, we were like, the door was open. I mean, they brought us down. Howie and I were treated to Michelob. Remember, they brought them out of the a coolers that looked like well, was everything nice. was made out of wood. In None the, of you guys tr ever treated hotel. me that way in Springfield, let me just tell you that. Yeah, we, we were nice. li living, living gods in Nashville. And we had a blue suede Lincoln we were driving around in. Yeah. You ever seen a blue suede ring? You just get out and brush it off every now and then. And we shot one of Howie's videos 
uh, in the middle of the night, somewhere between about 1.30 and 3.30 a.m., on the streets of Nashville. Oh, the Willie went to Amsterdam yeah. video. Gorilla uh, deal at Tootsie's yeah. Orchid Lounge. On, and then we got it right in Waylon's hands. And he says, I'm going to look at this on the bus. And <laughs> and so did we did for Waylon Jennings. That was when he put it on hold to record. It never got done. Never got done. God rest no. him. He, he didn't make it through, through that deal. But, but we, got to, we got to see a lot of stars there. And people that I, you know, everybody that was in the scene there at the Ryman, all these old people knew each other and we didn't know anybody okay and this guy walked by me and all i saw was his hat and he looked like one of my kids and i looked over and i go that's got to be little jimmy dickens yeah. and sure enough it yeah. was yeah and then people would start singing and you didn't know who they were and they only got to sing one song and when their song come out you know here's skeeter davis doing don't say no it's the end that of was, the world. That was the last and of those people. And she started singing. I go, I didn't know that's who that was. That was the last of those people. Lim, little Jimmy Dick, as I remember when I tried to interview him, he said, you go take an old cold tater and wait. That's, yeah. what, that's what he told me. Anyhow, that was a big highlight. John Wilkes, ladies and gentlemen. Skinny. Helen. Skinny, thank you, buddy. You know, uh, we, we could be telling these stories all night. What happened to Mike Wildey? You don't come up here and tell something. I'm going on with this story. Danny's still here. Still oh, hi, Danny. You sit still. Scoot that over there. All right. Oh, Chico's a cameraman. Curly, get up here. This was our drummer, founding member of our bluegrass version of the Flat Creek Band, Mike Weldy. He was the manager of the, he managed the SDC campground, so we made him drummer because he thought he might be able to get us a job. <laughs> and our very first job was Flat Creek was flaying out by the swimming pool at the campground. And uh, it was awesome, man. It was big time. Is this thing on? <laughs> you remember that, Curly? Didn't tell I got oh, that. Oh, yes. We oh, went I electric. Remember. remember when I got the electric guitar and uh, then the fat kid did I the remember. cannonball and electrocuted me around the deal? I remember yeah. it all. You tell, you tell one of your favorite stories, Curly. One of my favorite stories is the gig we played in Oklahoma. Oklahoma. We had the motor home. We took the bandwagon to Oklahoma. Which one? Vertigrass River Festival. It was a pig roast. Supposed to be a pig roast. Right. We were supposed to be paid. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot of those where they said, people don't realize uh, that they said, you don't, don't get paid don't, a lot. Don't, you don't need to bring any food. Yeah. Just bring your instruments okay, and we're going to play. Get over here. And we were supposed to make, I think, five or six, seven, eight hundred dollars. So anyway, when we got there, we played, and they still hadn't put the pig in the, in the roast yet. And you know how long it takes to roast a pig. And so anyway, we didn't get any food that night. Come to find out the people that took the entry fee, the money at the gate that everybody paid, ran off with the money. <laughs> so, so we had no food. We, we had saw no a guy with a backpack and we, and we loaded full of cash on a, on a little dirt bike heading across off. the Verde Grass River Valley. And, and we spent the night hungry as hell. And I remember Bob, Bo, the next morning he was so mad, he gets this little Charlie Manson look on his face. <laughs> well, and he's always, always had that look on his face. Are you all, kidding me? All he's got is his underwear on. And he's found a hatchet. <laughs> he goes, where's that? <laughs> he's he just slapped. He's telling, he snapped. He walks through the campground telling everybody to eat a bowl of the F word. All the bands are talking, <laughs> like 30 bands from this weekend deal. Nobody got so, paid. And it, it just got madder and madder. Made, up. They ran off for the money. There was no pig. <laughs> <laughs> we, so, we, and there's no, there's not a, you know, we're out in the country. There's no restaurant or anything. So we get back in the bandwagon the next morning. We're so hungry. We, we, we finally get to the west side of Joplin when we find a Dairy Queen. <laughs> and I think we ran it. We, it's not all fun and games. It's no, not all glory we, because we took their this stuff inventory. happens um, a we, lot. We ate and ate and ate Dairy Queen burgers for a good hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, a, you got, everyone's got to bring up the bad stuff. It's, uh, yeah, it's so funny. Those memories, are, they last forever. They, they do. Everyone here thinks that, you know, yeah. you know we, we fart unicorn flowers, yes, you know, did. in, this, yes, in this business. That's not true. I remember, I remember the pig roast for the Vets Club in Springfield. Oh, yeah, the Vets pig roast. We Vets did pig several of those. Yes. yes. I remember right before we started, uh, some guy had bought a brand new pickup truck, big wheels on it, big four-wheel drive. And he, had, he was showing it off to everybody and had a, 
I think probably 15 people in the back of the truck. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely a very high center of gravity high going center on. High center gravity running up and down the hills way out there where we were playing and rolled that thing over. And people went right flying. in front of us like right a slow motion. I go, I don't know about these vets' pig rolls. It's crazy, People man. went flying. Ambulances was called in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, that was one. That was how uh, that started. <laughs> I also remember before I played with Mark, I played with uh, another band, and we played in Kimberling City quite a bit at the uh, Pier 13. It was at the corner. And we played there every Friday and Saturday night. And Mark, Mark would come over every once in a while and hear us, and he always thought I was too loud. No, and, no, and, no, I couldn't hear you over the bowling pin, crashing <laughs> at the bowling alley up above. Are you kidding me? And, and, well, I thought I was too loud. So, and I, and I made too many drum rolls. <laughs> so, so, so He was hired because you were good, Mike, and you were also the manager at the Silver Dollar City Campground. That's true. And this is how the music game works. It's who you know, baby. It's who you know, okay? You know, you know, we kept losing inventory <laughs> at the mini market. Hey, I was living in Mountain Hollow down no, the road. No, 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 no. We'll, we'll figure this out here. Losing inventory. <laughs> We kept losing. They even took me up to Springfield and had wired me up for for lie detector tests. <laughs> Wanting to know. Well, that corporate we world—that's why I could never join that but deal. Said the thing could never make any money. I wasn't <laughs> taking anything out. It wasn't long after that that somebody wrote a song. We're going to pay the mini market back. <laughs> I wonder who that brother was. brother Jimmy down the road there. Curly, you know, uh, everybody loves these stories from the road, and I think we need to all get together and write us a big old book. We should because do Because right now, Chico's over there going, hey, Howie, do you have a watch? Mike Weldy, ladies and gentlemen. That was our Flat Creek portion. Thanks, Mike. God love you, man. One last one. We'll talk, we'll talk more. Now, where's Jason LeMasters? We're going to get to this deal here. Uh, huh? He, you get him up. Where is he? I got one last one. Okay, good. I got another Flat Creek story. So we, as Marcus said, we uh, we opened up a lot of clubs and a lot of bars and a lot of events and you know first time of this, first time of that. And so uh, we got uh, invited to open up a bar called the Mezzanine. I don't know whether any of you remember that that uh, nightclub. Commercial club. Street. It was on Commercial Street. There was only one other bar on Commercial Street, and that was Lindbergh. It was kind of across the street, and uh, it was it used to be a haunted hotel and. And uh, so there was all these stories flying about the, the ghost and about all these noises and all this kind of crap going on and, and uh, up on the second floor. So they hadn't done all the remodeling and we were opening the thing up and we got out there playing. We were having a pretty good time as we always did. And, and I saw this lady walk in and she sat down at one of the front tables and she had a motorcycle helmet on, this red sparkly motorcycle helmet. And she was older, so it looked unusual. And she sat down at the table, and she had a book and some stuff, and she was there and clapping her hands and topping her feet and, and, uh, and really enjoying the show. We got ready, and we, uh, we took a break, and she stood up and got on top of the table and started singing hymns and preaching to the crowd. And, and I, went, I went, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> we went outside, smoked a cigarette, and she had a little mini scooter. That was before they... They had scooters now, but little scooters. She was riding her motorcycle up and down Commercial Street, you know, preaching in the bars. <laughs> and we, we were lucky enough to have her sit in in our set. <laughs> Commercial Street was always fun to play. I, man, I loved it. It was awesome. Danny Boyd. Always met lots of nice characters. <laughs> that really was, man. A lot of stuff, a lot of material. You can't write good songs without material. Now, you see this guy right over here. Now, after the Flat Creek band kind of dissolved, now since Bobby and them didn't come up here, I got to keep moving because Chico's real nervous and stuff, and he don't allow music at Music Monday of the Ozarks. So, so Stormy, is that you? You're on the board of directors, aren't you? You know, at least I've tried to play a ukulele, okay? Come on. Thank you, Chico. Now, this guy right here, you all, you all know who it is. You take you take that over there. No, I, I don't know. I think I got the Rona or something. I don't give that to Jason. Sterilize away. It's like loaning a guy your harmonicas. Come on, Jason. I trust you, man. Sit down. I Clorox that to microphone. Be a sound man. Come on, <laughs> Mr. Sounds Great. He worked at Sounds Great. They didn't call it Sounds Okay, did it? That's right. Sounds pretty damn good. This man right here, Jason Lemasters, ladies and gentlemen. He's a legendary guy from. 
guitar player from Springfield. He's played with everybody. I'm, I'm actually from Crane in Revisville. So you from Crane? Yeah, I got out of there just before you showed up in, in Aurora. You know, that's just a little bit of a deal uh, against us Lee and people. That's just a little bit of a I made it through the first grade, and then they sent me to, <laughs> sent me to Springfield. Crane's the prettiest little town, you know. They got the Crane Broiler Festival. I didn't know that, Jason, all the years that we knew each other. and Yeah, I didn't know it. I'm sorry. Jason, tell bands you played in. Jason, when I got out of a little uh, spin-dry college, as we call it, it was a... A little place that we don't want to talk about. I said, we got to get the band back together. Wait, I don't have a band anymore. After about 10 years, the, the Flat Creek band kind of went their own ways. Jason it was and... Uh, it was the Coconut Brothers for a little bit. Oh, we did. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah. was that after that one? What's that? The Coconut Brothers. Oh, was that before? Big C and Jeff. And I, okay. I, I, okay, that's right. I, I came in and replaced Big C. Oh, I that's think. right. It was Craig Richardson and, uh, uh, who was, who, and Jeff, Jeff Whittington yeah. and, uh, and me and you. Yeah. Jason the Masters moved in. You know, those we've lost uh, John and, and Larry Teeters no and longer with Jeff, us. Jeff too. And, and Jeff, and Jeff Whittington. That's why I'm here. I want to speak about Larry, because Larry was, uh, yeah. he was like the third founding member. That's right. Of the Hill A little Cats, trio. And he was a funny son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> but he would sit there and just sit there, and then you get maybe five words, and if you pay attention, you're going to laugh your ass off, and that's the way Larry was. He was quiet type. Hey, Arthur, I, I, I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> he looks like Arthur, but he doesn't have any hair. I don't know. Jason was a hardcore player. You played, uh, you toured with uh, the Daredevils. What, you had Hangdog, uh, a lot uh, of your bands. Uh, uh, no, Jim Hangdog, it was. Uh, uh, Granny's, oh, he started his bathwater league guitar player when he was 16 years old. Can't overlook that deal. I started out with the the Fool's Face guys, Jimmy Wirt and Brian Cough. Oh, you did. I played with them when I was younger. And then, oh, really? Then Jimmy Wirt, and then somehow ended up in Granny's. And wow. And went from there to Howie and the Hillcats. I like, can't whoa. believe you're, I'm getting this much info out of you. That's the first stuff he said in like 20 years since I I talked to. Him. I can talk, but I don't like listening to myself <laughs> think. Okay. We had some large time, didn't we, Jason? Man, this guy's one of the best lead guitar players. We got three redacted pages here, mostly about oh, me God, and oh Howie. My. No, no, this is, that's can't, why. Can't read any of that. Uh, there would be no Howie without you guys. You know what I'm saying? Everybody that's, that's here, there'd be no such a thing. Without you guys, it's a symbiotic relationship. It's a wonder we didn't get arrested. <laughs> well, we, we did. <laughs> oh, you got, nah, nah, nah. Hey, you know, if the police don't show up, it ain't a real party, is it? Then you guys, you guys remember that? It ain't a party. Jason, one of my heroes of the deal, and we, we started a little trio together, me and him and Larry. Our very first gig, uh, Gary Summers, they talked us into letting us play out in the back. We were the band in the box. Told Gary Summers, tight, tight. You couldn't drive a pin up his ass with a sledgehammer. And I go, Gary, he goes, no, nah, after Custer's. We're done having live music. I ain't having live music. I go, it's a little three-piece, Gary. We're not going to play. He said, he, said, he said, you got Jason to play? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I got, okay. got Jason. Okay. <laughs> and so we promised uh, Gary Saunders a cartoons. That we told him that if we don't keep people there after dinner to at least 10 o'clock, you don't owe us nothing. But I was taking a real gamble on you guys' income with that deal. I want you to know. I apologize. <laughs> and I was, I was confident. And uh, otherwise, you know, it was like, what, 50 bucks a piece? That's the gold standard Bitcoin. That's what we're still making Frank today. 50 bucks a piece. And uh, he put us in a box. We kept all our gear back in the beer garden. We were the band in the box, having the Hillcat Trio. Put a quarter in, the band comes out. <laughs> pluck, pluck, pluck. Yeah, it was a little undignified, but it sure was easy not carrying gear around, Jason. You know, we had always had trouble with that. Well, who showed up and set up every night? <laughs> Jason... It's not called Sounds Okay. We, we went to work in Branson, and we came home at 4.30 and got home at 5, took a shower, jumped in the truck, drove up to 6 o'clock, set up the band, played, got drunk. I know. 11 o'clock, how he started wanting to party, and I had to work the next day. So. Well, my, my new wife told me that I had to quit bringing the crowd home with me because, you know, uh, she said, you got to quit bringing everybody with you now. Uh, I'm sorry. I was young. I was young. Uh, but Jason, you were right there with me. That's why I had to call your wife all the time, remember? I go, Jason, I'm getting Jason an Uber. We didn't have Ubers back then. We had Goobers. We had, we had friends that would come by if they're that direction and pick you up if you needed to. 
<laughs> For some reason, my wife actually bought his shit when he would call. She would believe him or not. I don't. I was a counselor. I was trying two to in counsel. the morning. Two in the morning. How he's on the phone and you're believing what he's saying. I go, Jason might have got a bad mushroom over that cartoon. Said he's a little sick. He's in the bathtub sleeping right now. And uh, his wife was always very understanding. Musicians, if you ever know musicians that are married, it's always the single guys in the band that are the assholes, okay? Because they're, that's DR, aren't they? They blame everything on the single guys. I don't care what kind of a pillar of the community that we are, we were, okay? And I want to apologize to you public for all that kind of stuff. <laughs> I, I, I'm over it now. I'm, I'm I did take you to Mound City, Iowa, where they left us a couple deer, and Bo Brown skinned them right out there hanging on a deal. They go, we brought a present for the band, and next morning we woke up in this big bound house up in Iowa somewhere, Mound City. There were two dead deer hanging out on a deal. Bo goes, we're going to get those. And <laughs> Bo's out there. I go, oh, it don't get no better than this, Jason. <laughs> Bo skinned him out. He made a jacket out. He tanned one of the hides. He showed up with his new jacket, and he goes, uh-oh. I go, what's that? He goes, that's a bullet hole right there. <laughs> Most beautiful you still got. It. We cut up all the meat, threw it in the band van, all the venison. It was a present for the band. That's the nicest tip I think we ever got from anybody. And uh, Jason didn't know what to think, but I'm glad you hung with us. He got a real job shortly after that, uh, being the head guy. That sounds great. The sound deal that installed... Thank you, Stormy. Thank you. Does your wife know you're out tonight? What's going on? Okay. <laughs> so. Oh, you board? You, you're a board member? I didn't even know they had a board over here. That's awesome. I thought it was just Chico and the camera and the microphone. We ain't got no music at Music Monday. So I'm going, sorry, Chico. I, uh, thank you. Stormy, I'm glad that you're the voice of reason in this organization. Thank you very much. You know. <laughs> Anyhow, Jason, you know, this is the most he's spoken, and I was just proud to be a part of his deal. And we're not done yet. This deal here is not a swan song for anybody, okay? We're still, we're still playing. We're still writing. We're still playing music. So Jason, I go, Jason, he goes, I'm going to have to quit the band. I got a real job. So... He, what do we do? So Jason goes, we need to get that Richie Rebooth. Let's get Richie Rebooth. And I'm going, Richie Rebooth? I go, we're going to have to bait him in because he may be a little overpriced. I don't know, man. He was awesome. So one day Richie showed was, up. We put his ass to no, work. That was the fourth time I quit. The, the, sec yeah. the second and the third time was Billy Brown. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm Billy. Well, Billy Brown and, played and for he was, quite a and while. he was a lot louder than Richie, and you were glad to have me back. He was out. <laughs> He was after you. What was Billy Brown after you? No, I you hired Jason. Back after Billy. Remember? After Billy, okay. It's a hiatus. Uh, See those. If you're around Howie for a while, you might have to take a hiatus. You know. Well, I have a little. Co Is that what they I've got. <laughs> I got a little continuity problems. So Richie moved into the deal. By that time, Bo Brown over here uh, was playing with the cats. Come up here, Bo. Richie. Is Richie here? Hey, Richie. Don Randolph. Don Randolph came over from the from the homegrown guys. Hi, <laughs> Hey, Richie. Richie don't like anybody. You come here and give me a hug. Come here. I've had my shots. You gave me the COVID. I forgive you. Get over here. I didn't give you no COVID. Wasn't you? No. Might have been Seth. Seth Randolph. Come up here, buddy. Yeah, we that. did 50 of us had a school. I wasn't at your class reunion. You played with me the night before. You weren't no, born then. I'm not pointing fingers. So you, you're saying I gave it to you. No, no, but that was the rumor. No, no, no. In, in modern time, here's what we do now as bands. We give each other diseases as you know. We've had that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> we gave you one. Might not be the worst thing I got playing here, man. <laughs> this is Rich Reba. This is Bo Brown. That's Seth Randolph, son of uh, Don Randolph, and there the boy Josh Randolph played with us too oh. for a while. And uh, I'm just glad we finally got to the 90s. Oh, not on my. Yeah. Damn. Well, they, we're going to be done about three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Starting out with Jason and Larry, this is a 32 year. We've been together 32 years as as the Hillcats. How I mean, you went back about 60 years when you started. Yeah. 
Yeah, you were 12 years old when this yeah, show started. Yeah, right, exactly. No, it, the band started about 1990. That do the math. Not, not, not. That's 32 years. Not, not, not. You guys are still at the inside. And I started in 92. You're playing inside. In 92. Hey, hey, hey Howie. Okay, you missed. You, you, oh, is hey, that what it was? Hey, Howie. Okay. You need to hold the mic over there when he's talking. Bo. Okay, Bo. <laughs> I'll fill in some details. Continuity here. Okay. I was uh, I was working out in California doing bird studies in '92, and when I came in, I knew Howie and um, uh, Jason and Larry Teeters had been playing at uh, cartoons, and so like inside, and there was no T Bone was in there. He wasn't full time though. He was in he was in and out. Mark Wilhoit, R I P. Love that guy. But anyway. Uh, then I came in, and Jason, it was still, it was the four of us for a while. Okay. And then, uh, th then the next year is when they built the beer garden and the bar and the, and the, and the, and the, the box. And then we had uh, Tubby for the drummer. Christian, Christian Carson for a drummer. Yeah. And uh, Wayne Carson. Oh, is that right? Well, you fired the, the, well, the list of bands, the list of bars that we couldn't play in kept getting bigger because Christian was our drummer. So, <laughs> you know, he's no longer with us. Don't speak I bad of the dead. Well. Go ahead. Hey, he'll laugh at it. No, he I would laugh know. at <laughs> it. Yeah, we love him. We had to let him go. But see, I, I was not a personnel guy, so I let, I let these guys fire people. See, yeah. So anyway, it, it, it was a slow progression to get to this. <laughs> then the, the band kind of co coalesced with us four and uh, Kelly, Kelly Brown. and uh, um, and just played a lot through that throughout that yeah Hardcore, with that nine to one, business know, four nights a week. with wow. Benny Mahan drumming Benny. and for me to get to play in a band with Benny Mahan after what a legendary life he lived oh yeah so that was quite a quite an honor yeah yeah but but Seth. Was Benny's understudy. So. I, used, I used to bring Seth with me to Harlow's when he was like 12 years old, you know, and, and Benny said, hey, set up my drums, will you, Seth, you know. Then he'd play for a while, and, hey, Seth, I need to go pee. Come up here and play, you know. <laughs> when you look back, Benny's standing by the bathroom. I look back, and there's another drummer back there. He's like 16 years old. He went, you know, and was, we never missed a beat. Never missed a beat, and you were just a kid then, and I loved it. Benny's back there going, I kind of like having me an understudy over there. Okay, I want you to yeah, talk. When yeah. you get I'll talk. I think I joined around as like 97 or 98, and that kind of became the lineup that actually was around for, for quite a while, and we did the records and stuff like that. Tell, yeah, them, so. tell them a fun anecdote about how we met. Didn't you meet some guy, you hitchhiking or something? Like oh, I was, oh. Uh, my car got stuck at... I was out front of Hoover Music, and this, this guy asked, hey, do you need a ride? Sure. And he goes, yeah. Well, oh, you go to a music store. You, you play music around here? And I, I was like, yeah. yeah. He goes, you might know my old buddy Floppo. <laughs> I'd never met yeah, Richie at the like time, him. and a guy comes through I'd seen since high school. Rick. He said, you know anybody, anybody yeah. musicians in town? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that was one of the first things. A guy named Plopo. Little did I know. Richie knew at that moment he wanted to join the band. I think I might have been in the band. I think yeah. right, right around the beginning, I was like, yeah, I know Flop. Floppo. And tell us about your first gig with us and uh, the, some of the anecdotes and stuff I like that. I really don't remember what was Well, the I remember gig. them country gigs way out. It kind of scared the shit out of you coming from Long Island and all, you know. Yeah. He goes, man, you won't believe I, there, was, there was some kind of a weird white... White deer. What was that oh, that I, night? I, we I, we'll tell. We'll tell. We'll way out in Booger um, County, uh, out there. Well, I was always suspicious that he had to get some somebody from Long Island to play guitar in his country band. That was, that was the we first. We needed red, that something was the first, new. That was the we, first red flag. We needed something new. A guy that talked funny. It was yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but soon after joining the band, I was always getting to take it out to these, you know, places in the woods and stuff like that to play gigs, and it was. <laughs> it could be a little terrifying sometimes, you know, you, you know what I mean, if you're not used to that kind of thing. And I found, you know, the Cross Bronx Expressway to be less fearful than some, some dark woods somewhere, you know, you know what I mean, where, you know, just shit's lurking around every tree and corner, you know what I mean? Were you at yeah. What? Were you at Purdy? No, I wasn't at Purdy. Oh, Purdy. Oh, God. I wasn't enough. One time we were going out of rehearsal at his house, and I'm in the car with him, and I'm driving, and... And we're going, something runs across the road. I, to this day, I really can't identify what it was. It was white, 
and it flashed across, and I didn't, didn't run like a dog, and he said it was albino deer, and I it's, it's just went back and forth for a while, and there was a lot of fuck yous. We <laughs> do like have albino deer, but Yeah, we're going to your house, yeah, too. Yeah, and then we got to his house, he goes, that was one of those meth lab retrievers. <laughs> So, so yeah, yeah, it's real. There's, yeah, yeah. I, I was, I was afraid. I didn't know if I was gonna make it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know what the hell was gonna happen. Fucking deliverance, you know. We had good food at your house, so that that kind of that kind of calmed me down a little bit. No, there's been a lot of those. There's been a lot of those boat dot gigs. One which what we almost drowned. We almost died a few years ago. Right? We had too much stuff on the pontoon boat and the boat was sinking. And before then, I had that moment where I was looking at, I'm a pretty good swimmer, I was looking at the shoreline going, I was looking at the guitar as a flotation device and figuring how I was going to get out of this one. Yeah. Yeah. No, that was, my, that was my beater telecaster, but that's not the point. The point is we almost died, Howie. <laughs> well, I've got, an, I've got a, a, a statement about that. So that's a little how many, There's a lot of people that have played in a band with Howie in here. I bet every single one of them has had a, at least a couple of communal experiences with that. Yeah. They've either been close to death at one point, or they've Near seen death. how Howie draw back on the manager because they wasn't going to pay us. So how many people saw Howie draw back on somebody whenever they wasn't paying us? Drew back on me a couple of times. Yeah. Hey, Randy, <laughs> we just unloaded the liquor in your bar. Yeah. All you. That's right. You know what else you're going to do? Gee, Let's talk about music some okay, more. Richie, what was what was the real highlight though of of the Hillcat gigs that you've done? I know engineering. Oh, Steve. Well, let me tell you about engineering. While we were together, all of us, including Kelly Brown, and the highlight was doing the record. Creating the, the record music was the was the highlight. That's the record. We did three long play albums. You have copious notes. I take here notes, man. Yeah. I can't remember shit. I got to write it down. We did three, Richie. We did three, Low Tech Man, which I'm, Richie engineered. Yeah. We yeah. did that over there at his deal. Uh, roadside Oddities, we did Aloha from the Beaches of Missouri first. That was, I was with Lou, that Lou Whitney. Jason. That was That's Lou. Jason. Oh, that was Jason Lou Whitney, and Jason was one. on that one. Uh, roadside Oddities, we did the Big Gas Balloon Race, which was an EP extended. And that, was on, uh, um, that was on Low Tech Man, actually. Yeah, but we, we did an extended play four song deal. We added on to that other deal. It's over there. Go over there and refresh your memory. It was a really good period. He had a really good group of songs, and we did the record kind of guerrilla recording, home studio-like. And it, uh, Everybody familiar with Low Tech Man? Anybody? Does anybody listen to any of this stuff? I mean, come on. Seth, yeah, it's awesome. I know. Sitting here talking about ukuleles and drowning and all this bullshit. We're not talking about any of the music. You know what I mean? <laughs> You had, to turn this, you had to turn this microwave off when we were That's cutting. right. If you, you, couldn't, you, had to, you couldn't turn the microwave on flush right, the when, or flush the toilet when the tape was rolling. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Or otherwise the power would break. We pulled a good yep. record out. No, we did a good one. That's when you were ter caretaken for Weldon King. Yeah. How he was in, and you'd bring Weldon by sometimes. Well, and it was, yeah. yeah. Who are these dreadful people? Yeah. <laughs> Well did a love but, uh, recording studio. But uh, it was, that was a lot of fun doing that record. It yeah. was. Yeah. Seth? Yeah, no. yep. Egg yep. Seth. Yep. Seth. Seth. Benny. Tell them about what Benny did to uh, ease you into the, into the deal. Seth Randolph, he plays in all kinds of cool bands. Mood Ring Circus. What the, the cars, the cursed, cursed. cursed. The cursed man, his kids, he's an amazing. He's like the hottest little drummer right now in southwest Missouri and climbing. He's known in well over six, seven counties now, and uh, it's awesome. Tell these lovely folks about your childhood experience hanging out with old farts and stuff. Well, like you said, I was a child. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I thought Howie was quite colorful. Um, I remember uh, cartoons. He taught you how to cuss. Yes, he also taught me how to like heckle people. I didn't know how this guy did it. He's one of the best front guys I've ever seen. Yeah. Someone walks in and he says, hey, it's good to see you wearing men's clothing again. You know. I didn't like hecklers either, Seth. <laughs> so, I'm, I mean, I, maybe 11 years old when you started bringing me out. The, the band in the box, I remember all of that. And uh, yeah, and, and Howie and Benny, of course, Dad was great taking me around these guys for the music, but the, he would always let me play. I, that's all I wanted the whole night long, get up and jam with these guys. And I'm just a little kid, I could barely play, but they would still let me up there. And, uh, 
it, I have some great memories of that. I remember laughing a lot. I can't, I can't remember a lot of specifics, but, but my face aching a lot from <laughs> hanging around these guys. And uh, when, uh, I think a couple weeks in the summer, you had Howie come out and build a deck on our house. And he was kind of... Yeah, I think it's still standing, I think. The house burned down. The deck's still there, Daddy. <laughs> you got to have a day job, my friend. Don't quit your day job. We told you. We told you. Well, I remember I'm a little kid, and he's saying, you, you could have 30 fat chicks dancing on this deck. And, <laughs> and I'm just like, this is, this is colorful. So uh, I remember my brother is helping. He can't be here, Josh. Uh, we're thinking of him and his wife. But, but uh, Josh is helping uh, he's he's your your cutting man. So he's cutting a two by two by twelve, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Up it was up high when we yeah cut. yeah a green two by twelve uh, for the upper deal. And I'm on the ladder coaching everybody. And these two little shits, Seth and Josh, dropped a two by twelve on my forehead. I had no. I dropped. To do with I it. dropped off the ladder. and Knocked me off. Do with it. Colder than a dead there. fish. And. Becky come running out of the house. He goes, oh, my God. Said, well, we killed Howie. We killed Howie. <laughs> I had nothing to lump, do with I it. mean, an immediate lump stuck out on my damn head. I was not cold. I can't remember if that's the same day or not. My brother sawed the cord off of the circular saw or not. But <laughs> Thank you, Dodge. <laughs> yeah, it was. You were a good carpenter, though. I, I was always coaching the boys, don't quit your day jobs because it's not always going to be there. Well, yeah. you can't do music. Monday, Needs Monday. something to fall yes, back on. Yes, but he has a good job. That's you used to have now. a good job. <laughs> music Monday. I'm still self-unemployed. I got music. trouble. Music Monday. Music Monday. They don't play music. Why don't they just call it Talk About Shit Monday? <laughs> well, you said we could do what we wanted to. No, I got to have that. You give me that. No, no, Here's no. the part in summation. Maybe yeah. we need to get to that part now. Okay, thank you, Richie. Richie, yeah. I didn't know you could see without your glasses. Okay. Chico, you make me nervous, man. You call and you go, no, there's no music, but you can do whatever you want, Howie. Do whatever you guys want. Okay, now tell us about the time you wrote the ukulele lady with, about the guy that ran off with your, your girlfriend. That, no, that was, no, that was, no, that was a dog food salesman. <laughs> okay, in summation. In summation. <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, if people want to know, they ask me, he goes, how would you want to be remembered and, and all this? Jim. No, no, no. Shh, shh, shh. Play the ukulele, Rich. There, there ain't no so stinking music at Music Monday. I'm sorry, Jim. Okay, play it. Ukulele lady. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Whatever Jim wants, he's a major contributor to the music arts in the Ozarks. God bless you. And in summation, he asked how you want to, Chico said, how you guys want to be remembered. Well, I'd like to remember as a songwriter, musician, band leader, who always surround himself with better players. There's the secret to keeping the band. You don't have better to Better musicians, so better players than myself, okay? Another secret to band longevity is the fact we're all good friends, producing our own records. We formed our own records. Came out of the necessity to have a little control of your product. Uh, there's major, label error, major labels that we've all dealt with Remember what they called them, Richie? Short on fatties. It's too much. <laughs> He's got the major labels of our era. In our era, yeah, yeah, it, it, they had real deep pockets and real short arms. And what did they call them, Richie? Short on fatties. Short on fatties. That was Nashville, our closest deal to us. Right, yeah, exactly. Copyright. No, no, so, so we started making records for ourselves. It was like a one-stop shop. You did it all yourself. But I've always believed, personally, you'll see all the artwork over there. I believe that, the, you know, the, that music and, and the visual arts go hand in hand. That's why we got people like, you know, Weldon King covers, you know, Del Day Tony, John Wilkes videos, and, and things because it's a package. It's a package thing. So you guys get enjoy that. Hand over all the stuff. If you steal a couple CDs, just throw a couple bucks in that box over there. Because, you know, we, we depend upon the kindness of the others, right? So that's kind of the basic story. And we want to thank, uh, we, had, we had people all along. Jim Hershon over there and Jenny, executive producers that's helped produce these records. Low Tech Man, the balloon deal, uh, this new Hawaiian project I'm doing with the, with the Slack Key guys. Grammy Award winning guys, okay. Giant step for, for mankind. Uh, we had also, we've had uh, Donna Thompson. And Jim Day were very big 
we're very big sponsors for our, our records. So without these guys, without the patrons, there would be no records. It's, it's a symbiotic relationship. So we want to thank everyone and thank you all for coming out because Chico's like, give me this deal like he's not going to buy me a beer or something. Thanks for coming to music. Thank you very much, everybody. Monday. Thank you, guys. Take about. We love you guys. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Flat Creek boys, everybody.